Because when you're in the cold water, your body will make light that's stronger than the sun. This will turn on the melanin inside your body. People don't even realize dopamine is made from UV light, but they also don't realize that cold increases dopamine by 250%. You know why? Because your mitochondria inside you makes light that makes dopamine. Dr. Jack Bruce, thanks for joining the show. You are a true pioneer within the decentralized health industry. And personally, you have, uh, you have uh, participating in being the inspiration for guiding my personal research through the journey that I'm on. And you made a great figure on uh, Rick Rubin's podcast with Andrew Zuberman, which, which I personally think deserves a lot more uh, public attention through Andrew's uh, own uh, audience. So my first question to you is, why aren't we healthy? To give you the main reason, I think uh, globally, most people follow the United States way of doing science, which is centralized. And since Rockefeller 1911 and the Flexner Report, um, we have followed a path um, that allows big pharma to control things. Where we really went off the path is 1953, when Watson and Crick discovered DNA. The science that Rockefeller put in place became transfixed with studying genes, specifically nuclear, uh, and never realized there was another genome in the cell, which is the mitochondrial DNA. And the mitochondrial DNA is what controls the energy. And energy is what turns on and off the genes. So today in Western science, because you know, remember, the United States usually leads uh, the world down paths. So unfortunately, we've led them down the wrong path. We've led them down the centralized path that Rockefeller made. And um, 99 point, I should say 99% of the NIH budget in the United States goes to studying nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA. So therefore, 1% those two studying, we have this myopic focus on the wrong genome. And it turns out this should be very, very obvious to everybody who's listening to this podcast that if you look at the nuclear DNA like hardware, the mitochondrial DNA is the software. It turns out the software tells the hardware how to function. And the thing that centralized medicine is excellent at is acute care. Like if you guys break your legs skiing or in a motorbike accident or you fracture your spine, we're very, very good at dealing with that. But where we're very, very bad is chronic Neolithic disease like diabetes, obesity, autoimmune conditions, SAD, things like that. Why? Because in order to be an expert in these areas, you have to understand how energy uh, transformation through mitochondrial DNA uh, alters uh, the phenotypic response in these neolithic diseases. And that's why centralized MDs are impotent to fix these problems and they can't help. And that's why the first thing they do is they reach for the prescription pad, which is exactly what Rockefeller wanted us to do. Yes. And so the centralized way, is that because it's been used for profit? Is that is that the definition of the centralized way that everything is... Well, you guys, you guys are from Europe, so I probably, and I imagine your audience is going to be mostly, you know, from Europe. And I don't know if you guys know the story of how uh, modern medicine in the United States began, okay? So you do need this, you need the, the, the background of the story, because I think it's a very easy statement for Europeans to make that, oh, it's about profit. You have to understand why it's about profit. This is really, really important. So I'll lead you down a very quick history lesson. Uh, in the 1850s through 1911, John Rockefeller ran the biggest monopoly in the world. That monopoly was for kerosene and oil. It was called Standard Oil, okay? When Teddy Roosevelt came in as president after one of our presidents were assassinated at the turn of the century, 
um, Teddy Roosevelt decided to go after John D. Rockefeller because he thought uh, the things that he was doing were unfair and it was leading to undue political influence. So he had Congress take Standard Oil apart. So what did John D. Rockefeller do? He did something very, very wise as a profiteer. They broke his company up, but he told Congress back then that he would see to it that he would bankrupt the United States in some way for making this decision to ruin the business that he did. So when they broke Standard Oil up, some of the companies that you guys know now that exist from that are like Exxon, okay? Um, but what you may not know is most of the companies in Big Pharma also come from that breakup. And what did he decide to do? He decided to take things from waste products from petroleum and kerosene and begin to make uh, drugs. And how did he accomplish this task? Because you can imagine, this was a Herculean task. So in the, the time at, this time of uh, the United States, early 1910s and right before World War I, he hired a guy named Abraham Flexner who went and studied all the medical schools. Most of the medical schools in the United States followed the German model. And um, he basically realized that if he could eliminate vitalism and bring everything to reductionism that he could control the curriculums of the medical school so that med young medical doctors would learn to use drugs instead of utilizing the natural things that are in nature okay so he was successful in 1911 doing this and he told all the medical schools at that time that if you don't follow the way we want to do things we won't give you money and as you know rockefeller was very very wealthy from oil so he could give fledgling medical schools quite a bit of money to do that. So the quid pro quo that he did, I'll give you money if you let me control your curriculum. So this is how Rockefeller gained control of the curriculums of medical school. And what did the curriculums of medical school do? Uh, they supported randomized controlled clinical trials. They supported um, the use of drugs over natural things in nature. Uh, and that went pedal to the metal all the way through. And the reason why this really hit with the American public, because like in 1937, when we had Alexander Fleming find penicillin, this fueled Big Pharma further to make you know more advances. People thought this was a wonderful thing. They didn't see the negative connotations to this system. At the same time, so you had two big decentralized, I should say, same time in America, same year, in fact. That's when we formed the central bank in the United States, decentralized moves in the U.S. Uh, now, when Watson and Crick came out and discovered DNA, this was the perfect opportunity for Rockefeller and his foundation to use this information so that they came up with the idea that the randomized controlled clinical trial could be used to control methodology so that people would be fixated about genes. And this allowed Big Pharma to have more control of not only medicine, healthcare, but the way it was delivered. As things developed in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, they extended that view then to hospitals, then hospitals buying doctors' practices, and then eventually making everybody who's a doctor an employee. When I first came out of medical school, no doctors were employees. Now today, every doctor in the United States, the hospital or the uh, body that gives you your United States, and I don't want to say every, but 99% are employees. So that's another way for centralization. Why? Because as you guys know in Europe, when the medical license tells you you have to take a COVID vaccine, you have to do it, otherwise you can't practice. You can't do this. But that's not the way medicine should be practiced. That's not the way science is supposed to be done. Science is about questioning. There is no consensus in science. Anything that's consensus is pseudoscientific. The story I'm telling you about Rockefeller, and how the system was, okay? But in the 20th century, this was lost because of the stuff built in the United States and then took this message all over Europe. Everybody followed Rockefeller through his foundation and his sons, who became very prominent politicians in the United States, followed like little puppy dog, okay? That's how the system was built. And now, here we are in 2023, um, I've been telling this story to my members and my readers in multiple podcasts. You guys are from Europe. So I don't know if 15 or 20 years ago, uh, the centralized entities tried to censor. 
They try to shut me up. They try to cancel me. Now, if you know the story, how it happened. Um, but ultimately, this is why we have the system we do. And the opportunity now for people like me to speak out. After um, the Uberman podcast, I realized that I was opening myself up you know, to another can of worms. And this is why it took me six weeks to answer Rick's text that he wanted to do this. And to be honest with you, I'd love to tell you that I felt um, that it was my choice to go on. It wasn't. My nurse said to me, she goes, Jack, she goes, I think this is the ideal opportunity for you to bring the message to the world again, like you tried to do 15 years ago, because now um, the world has changed. Like people in Europe are not going to be as, as compliant. People in Canada aren't going to be as compliant. People in Australia is not going to be as compliant. And she goes, I think people are also going to begin to understand, you know, why you have the belief you do that COVID was a, a, a compliance test for an economic reset. And it goes back to the story that Jacob asked me. If you don't understand how centralized modern medicine was built by Rockefeller and how it was tied to the central bank in the United States and why it is tied to profit, but you need to understand the details of why, then you're never really going to understand why we spend 99% of the NIH budget on, on studying nuclear DNA and not mitochondrial DNA because it was pretty obvious that decreases energy in the system, it's going to lead us to those of us in the United States three years ago who followed mitochondrial biology that using message RNA vaccines was the stupidest thing in the world because they were mitochondrial toxins. The spike protein was a toxin. And anytime you give a toxin that lead to collateral effects, which are diseases, which we're seeing now with myocarditis, we see it now with blood clots in the brain, we see it now with professional athletes all over the world, both footballers in Europe, football and as a cardiac arrest at, at 19 or 18 years old. So she convinced me that this was in the United States where, you know, like DeMar Hamlin, a uh, defensive back for the Buffalo Bills on Monday Night Football, you know, has a cardiac arrest. Now LeBron James's son is okay to begin to talk about. It. Now I'll be honest with Rick and Uberman. I didn't know if she was right. But I did the podcast early March in, in Malibu, California. It didn't get released until sometime in May. And you know, we're right now just finished July. Um, the response has been amazing. The response, like I feel, I feel kind of funny because every time I do a podcast now, everybody seems like this is new news. And for me, this is 20 years old story. But you guys act like, holy shit, this is all new. But it's really not for me. And I, I guess I have to laugh because it's clear that the first time around, the centralized entities were good about shutting me down. Why? Because you guys didn't know the story. You didn't, you didn't hear it the first time around. But now, all of a sudden, it resonates. So that proves that my nurse is smarter than me. We'll get back to the conversation in a moment, but first I need to tell you about our sponsors, Nordic Kings. Nordic Kings produce the highest quality of organic grass-fed beef organ supplements. I've used their products for years, which provides me with so many bioavailable micronutrients that I don't need to take any synthetic multivitamin pills. So if you like me, don't like the taste of beef organs, or you just need to spike your vitamin and mineral levels, Nordic Kings is a reliable and high quality source. And that's exactly why we've chosen to partner up with Nordic Kings. So head over to their website, nordickingse en where you can save 15% off your next order by using the code HOLISTIC15. Yeah, I have, I have, I've known you for for quite a few years now. So, uh, so the Huberman podcast was not the first time that I that I got presented to your to your messages. Um, but I still think I'm a bit disappointed in the aftermath of that of that podcast that that he didn't share it more than he did for his own audience because. Yeah, yeah but I can I, tell you why. Yeah. I mean, you have to realize why. I, I just on his glass eyes to be awoken. And this information, when you're as popular as information, is uh, this goes to the foundation of the problem in centralized medicine. You have to realize he works at Stanford University 
which is one of the centralized entities in the in the place. He also is a PhD, and much like me, he's where I was 20 years ago before he had Windex. But he is. You have to be very careful about how you disseminate. It. Now, I will tell you, Rick Ruman doesn't bring me on this podcast and doesn't talk about it. I think if you listen, is the guy that decided to put us together. Rick is doing some other things behind the scene right now to make sure the story gets out further. Like, it's not going to die if you listen to some of Andrew's podcasts since then. You could see the effect of what he and I talked about. It's in there. But you need to realize it's still, it's still new. It's only been a couple of months. And I understand that's what you're saying that you want to see him do more. But do I understand it? Am I giving him enough rope? Yes, because I understand how powerful the message is. Like the implications, I will tell you, people who have followed me for 10 or 15 years, they don't understand the implications. Like in my Patreon blog since the podcast went live, I've been writing about diseases with these playing many, many different things that has for much centralized science but the problem is I have to put it behind a paywall because the implications and it's blown people's minds. Why? Um, I think I can fully explain um, why, because these things are dangerous to the paradigm. Guess what? If I put it out there in the regular world, I'd have people coming after me left and right. If people knew how much power they have by reconnecting with nature and they could disconnect with the, the pharmaceutical cabinet, this is a big deal, and um, it's uh, it's a daunting task. I I don't I'm not upset with Andrew at all, to be honest with you. I know a lot of the people in the audience are, but I'd say let's give it some time and see how it goes. The one thing I will tell you, I can't give you all the details, but uh, my friend Rick Rubin is stepping on the gas pedal. We have a couple other things that are planned with here and down the road that are going to be like diesel fuel on the fire for this story. So I can promise you, even if Andrew's not the place the message gets amplified, I I don't think we're turning back. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I just want to ask uh, Rick Rubin's story. That's also with you. How did you guys link up and, and, and how did that, how was his change? Because I also, I didn't even know that he was that much into these things, which was really interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, you got to remember, he started out, he's also a guy from New York City like I am, and he started out as a student at NYU and basically saw the Zeke Eastern music in New York changing in the 1980s. And this is when, you know, disco was dying, rock and roll was still androgynous, and all of a sudden these young black kids from the city started showing up with hip-hop music, and he was absolutely fascinated by it. And he used to bring these young black uh, artists into his dorm room at NYU when he was in college. And he started to make records with them. And you remember, these people were the outcasts in the music business. They couldn't get any uh, music deals alone. And Rick changed that. Rick changed the whole landscape of hip hop music. The problem became Rick got involved in the music business. So this was staying up late at night, started wearing sunglasses at night. He never saw the sun. So over a period of time, over a decade, he got to be 400 pounds. Okay. He got his biology started to fall apart, even though he was very successful. Then he started to do other music, he started to do Metallica, he started to do Adele, he started to do Aerosmith. You know, in other words, his client list got bigger and bigger and bigger because his effect on the music business was huge. But as he got more successful, he got more sick biologically. And that's how he and I crashed together. He began to follow me. And then one of the guys who co co wrote his book with him, Neil Strauss, who used to be the editor of Rolling Stone magazine, Neil runs a, a very interesting group that you would be very hard pressed to find. Basically takes care of millionaires to try to optimize their health. And Neil asked me to come out and speak to the group, I don't know, about 10 years ago in Los Angeles. And Rick was one of those guys. And Rick had told me he'd already been following me, doing all the things he was doing, and he already changed his life substantially. He was down like 150 pounds, 
He was no longer running his business the way he was doing it. He was a real big believer in CT. In fact, he built the CT deck in his house in Malibu. Um, you know, um, that actually was highlighted on a podcast he did with Tim Ferriss. He spent over a million dollars on it. And then I kept pushing him. I said, Rick, you got to get out of Malibu. So he did that. He went to a better latitude. Then when he was there, he hit plateaus. He said, you got to get out of there further. So he went further south. And um, then it coalesced in a medical problem that he had, that he contacted his friends, but also the people that he respected in medicine. And two of the guys that he contacted were me and Peter Adia. Uh, and Rick asked me, told me what the situation was with his heart, that he had a big problem that was going to require surgery. And uh, he said, is there anything unusual or from a biohack perspective that I could come up with that would help him out? And that's where I came up with the idea to use methylene blue for him while he was on cardiovascular bypass and I he didn't care about why it worked he said if you tell me it's something I should do I'm going to do it but I warned him if he talked to the surgeon the surgeon would probably have an issue with it uh, he talked to Peter Addy about it Peter Addy told him it was crazy um, you know the way the story goes but Rick trusted me enough as the decentralized person he said I don't think Jack is going to bullshit me so uh he started to use the methylene blue right after his surgery. And long story short, Rick had a remarkable recovery, you know, with his surgery. He still uses it to this very day. Um, the surgery he had was very, very risky, very risky. Um, and um, he told the story in the podcast. That's the reason, main reason I went to Malibu is because uh, I never spoke about it publicly ever. You know, it's it's a person, you know, private medical history. But when Rick said that we could do the podcast together, that he'd be okay talking about it now, he, he told uh, the story that three months after the surgery, Peter Adia came back to him and said, you know what? I've been looking into the papers around methylene blue, and he goes, this was brilliant that Jack told you about this. He goes, I would have never thought about this. And the reason... For you guys, the reason why the story is important, it highlights the difference between centralized and decentralized medicine. And see, well, anything about methylene blue and where it came from was the first drug that was actually used to treat um, uh, tuberculosis. We would use to see things on a slide. It was also uh, something that started out as a dye. that, And then it turned out the guys that were at the beginning of biochemistry, like... Uh, um, the two guys that were influential in TCA cycle and vitamin C biology, Linus Pauling and Albert St. Georgie, they understood that methylene blue did something very unusual both with electrons and, and protons in the TCA cycle. They could never figure out what it was, but they knew it was something quite beneficial for, you know, energy metabolism when it was broken. And um, since that time, we know a lot more information about it, but you don't know a lot of information about it as a centralized physician. Why? Because the drug is off patent. It's not patentable. That means it's not profitable. Big pharma. That's the reason why nobody knows about it. So the reason I brought it to the table is Uncle Jack scours medical history to look for those kind of stories so that we can plug it in to the right diseases that can help certain people. And when I explained to Rick, you know, kind of why I thought it would help, he said, okay, I'm going to do it. And, uh, of course, the bad thing about this story is that many people on the Internet want to use methylene blue because Rick used it. That's not the right way to do things. You have to use it for the right indications. And, unfortunately, most people don't do it that way. You know, they just decide in the biohacking community, okay, I'm going to do this because I think I can do it. And I don't like to see that kind of stuff happen. The thing that I appreciated about the story is that it highlighted the difference between centralized and decentralized medicine. But it also showed that a doctor like Peter Addy, who's very centralized, who's very close-minded like I was 20 years ago, has the opportunity to still adapt and change. Hopefully he continues to adapt and change over time, but not everybody adapts and changes at the right pace. And, you know, in my life, I adapted and changed when I was 40 years old. 
Uh, Peter has a chance to do that. Peter's a very smart guy, but, you know, I, I tend to go after him a lot on social media. Why? Not because I dislike him. It's because I know that he's smart. I know that if he goes the next step and adds decentralization to his medical practice, he's going to be a, a spectacular physician for the public health. Yeah, well, Huberman the same way. But remember, Huberman is not a clinician. But the, the real thing that Andrew can do, Andrew can teach future medical students at Stanford University some of this wisdom. And that's that's really all I'm looking for because I've told people in the, in the, in the past that when I went through medical school, I learned all the decentralized science. I know everything Andrew knows and I know everything Peter knows. Uh, and I know it very well. You know, to become a nurse or you have to be top of the class. So the thing is, when you know it and you think you know everything, because that's really what happens, you know, for guys at the top of the class, it's very, very difficult to break your own paradigm thought. And when I broke my paradigm thought, that's why I told you guys on Rick's podcast, Rick Huberman, that that 18 months that I looked through, that was the hardest 18 months of my life. Because I realized that everything that I was taught up to that time not only did I need to question it, but most of it was wrong. Um, and that 18 months is when I realized why the Rockefeller paradigm broke the rules. Uh, actually, the physics is what taught me why Rockefeller was fundamentally wrong. And it goes back to the randomized control clinical trial. It goes back to cause and effect. It goes back to, you know, the, I always try to tell doctors this and it offends them. That if you tell a lie long enough, just because you told it long enough that people believe it doesn't make it true. But that's actually what most medical students who will listen to this in Europe believe, that cause and effect is real and randomized controlled clinical trials are the gold standard. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's absolutely wrong. The other sacred cow that I slayed to Uberman, I said pretty much every single nutrition study that's ever been done in the world has been done on nocturnal mammals. Remember, we're diurnal. And it's been done in a blue lit lab. And then when you consider that the number one non-visual photoreceptor inside the human brain is melanopsin, which is a blue light detector, immediately you should say to yourself, uh, Houston, we have a problem. But that's actually not what's happening in centralized science. That's not what's going on in the United States. That's not what's going on in Europe. And that is the reason why we got COVID. That is the reason why we allowed the centralized experts too much leeway to tell us what to do when we're faced with it. And then when you begin to realize guys like Fauci who are much like Rockefeller because that's who enriched Fauci to do the things he's doing, they basically created a problem to solve a problem, to be able to control all of us, to gain more centralized control. And this is the reason I tell people now that the population in the United States, the population in Europe, the population in Canada, the population in Australia, basically you're being harvested like slaves. They're going to use uh, you to pay off the debts that the central bank has created over the last 125 years. And the best way to do that is to make you sicker, make you more controllable, so that you rely on the state. That's the step that's going here. This is part of what many, many people can't see, but you guys are in Europe and you understand like what's going on now with the Danish farmers in Netherlands. They're now, now trying to take farmland away. And then let's talk about the other guy in the United States, Bill Gates. He went from computer technology to vaccine bureau. Now he's trying to buy all the farmland in the West part of the United States. Why? Because he knows that food is going to be worth a lot of money when everybody's controlled. And then what else does he want? He wants to block the sun. We'll get back to the conversation in a moment, but first I need to tell you about our sponsor, Functional Self. Functional Self isn't just another hill stall. It's a lifestyle. They offer a carefully curated range of biohacking tools, supplements, and functional foods that are scientifically proven to elevate your well-being. I've used them for many years now in everything from the MacTech Magnesium to the Rosita Cod Liver Oil. And guess what? They ship all over the Europe, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. And that's why we have chosen to partner up with Functional Self. 
So if you're serious about taking your health to the next level, check out the full range at functionalself.com and use the code HOLISTIC10 to save 10% off your first order. So your question, Jake, a long time ago when we first started this podcast, I said, Jack, tell me how it's tied to the profiteers. You see the layers of the onion I've given you, how much more complex it really is. And then just in the last week, my demented president in the United States has come out and now is supporting the Gates program. You know, the program of Klaus Schwab, the program of the World Health Organization. So you guys may not know where I am now. I'm in El Salvador, 100% decentralized. In two weeks, I'm going to be talking to the administration of El Salvador, how to build the first decentralized program in medicine in El Salvador. Why? Because they've already built decentralized finance here by making Bitcoin legal tender three years ago. And the country and the population here has done spectacular since that decision. Uh, their GDP is over 10 every year for three straight years. You know, the other bad organization, the corollary to the World Economic Forum and the WHO in finance is the IMF. El Salvador has paid off both their IMF loans this year, in, in January of this year. So no longer are the people of El Salvador or the administration or Central Bank of El Salvador tethered to the bad policies of the IMF. I'm sure some of the people in Europe wish that was the case. Well, some of the people in the Middle East wishes their governments would do that. But the problem is those governments are still heavily centralized. They are still you know, tied to their belief systems you know, in and around economics, medicine, healthcare, and finance. And ultimately, the people, the power is still with the people. The people have to opt out. Just like you can opt out of centralized medicine by embracing mitochondrial medicine and uh, natural decentralization by utilizing nature, you can do the same thing by investing in Bitcoin and getting rid of fiat money. Every single vote. And there it counts. In other words, it hurts centralization of money. And remember, without centralization of money and rehypothecation, there's no way for them to control us. The problem is it's going to take a critical mass of all of us to realize this. And this is why I teach my members and have taught my members that health and wealth are fundamentally linked. You may not believe it now, but I promise you, the last four or five years, when you go through your own, uh, how shall I say, review, you're going to find out many of the things that you and I and Mads are talking about in this podcast are coming to fruition. You guys are seeing it, living it real time in Europe, as far as I'm concerned. The people in the United States have already been woken up. I can tell you that's the reason why RFK Jr. has got so much traction now to potentially run for president, because many of the things that he's saying now are echoing the decentralized platform. People in the United States, at least half the population, understands now how the game is being played. Everybody thought that COVID was just a health issue. They're beginning to realize it's not. And they're seeing it through the actions of the Biden administration. They're beginning to realize that all the things that I've said to you here, when Biden came out a week ago and said, we're going to block the sun. And, and, and Gates said, oh, now I'm going to buy up all the farmland and I'm going to help Biden block the sun. People are now beginning yeah. to realize what this game plan is. They can see it. And the, the next biggest scam after COVID is going to be the climate scam. Anybody who thinks CO2 is a problem fundamentally doesn't understand anything about photosynthesis. And, and Jacob, you know photosynthesis is a 100% story that's decentralized about light. Water and make sugar. Water and magnetism. That's how we take sunlight and water. Everybody learned about photosynthesis in third grade. But these guys effectively want to block that. And that's why Gates wants to buy farmland. That's why the, the government in the Netherlands wants to take farmland away from families who have owned that land for over 500 years. That's also the reason why Bukele, the president of El Salvador, wants to offer land and know-how to the farmers that are displaced in Europe to come here to, to make farms on the top of the lava tubes here. He's returning the power back 
to the people. When a politician does this, he's showing you that he supports decentralization. When a politician shows you Greta Thunberg, they're showing you how to put your wrists out and put your handcuffs on at the same time. Yourself. It's like Plato's allegory of the king. And unfortunately, there's many countries that are very compliant. You guys live in some of those countries. The worst one is probably Australia. Second worst one is Canada. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy that that everyone is just going along with it because to us, it's also very obvious. And when we hear someone like you, or we also been talking to Wim Hof and other people like that, it's so obvious that the that we deviate too much from nature and we have so many benefits from just some something as simple as a cold shower or breathing or something like that. But people, when you tell it to people and when you try to tell it to your family or something like that, they look at you like you're crazy because they haven't heard it before. Uh, so, Well, it's not. The reason that they think it's crazy goes back, Jacob, to the centralized story. Why? Because everybody believes that the doctors who are centralized have been telling them the truth. That's the reason why Wim's crazy. That's the reason why I'm crazy. And not only that, the other big problem is they can't believe it's that simple. Like get up with the sunrise, embrace the nature of your latitude and longitude, eat the food of your latitude and longitude, live as a wild animal would live. Because remember, humans are still part of the fabric of nature. We're not divorced from the story of evolution. We are a fabric in the quilt of nature. Even though we act like not because these two frontal lobes allow us to break nature's laws. That's the crazy part. And we need people to understand that the simple little things make the biggest difference in the world. That actually is one of the ideas of decentralized medicine. Why? It's called asymmetric change. So it's easy to understand for people who are in Bitcoin. Why? Because Bitcoin went 11 years or 13 years ago for one set. Now it's $30,000 a coin. So if you would have bought it in the beginning, that's a huge decentralized change. It's the best performing asset in the world over that time frame. But people in your country probably don't know that. They think it's Google or they think it's Apple or something else, but it's not true. So the flip side of that is nature is the same way. If you optimize your mitochondrial biology for energy production, you'll also get an asymmetric benefit. In other words, you'll stay as healthy as possible and never need the prescription pad. You'll never need to go see the doctor <coughs> because you'll have optimized circadian biology because circadian biology is what optimizes transformation of energy through the amount of And it's as simple as doing the things that we just said. And you have to be able to see it. But before people see it, I think they have to understand it. And what makes this difficult, as you guys know, if you've been following me for a period of time, understanding the physics of decentralization of nature is a tough game. Even Richard Feynman said a long time ago, he said, look, if you don't think that quantum mechanics is clear, then you just don't understand it. And he's, he also said that once you understand that nature is queer, accept her as she is. Just understand there may be things you don't understand about her, but continue to do what she does. And if you do what she does consistently over time, you will begin to hit levels in your health that you won't believe. You'll do phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, that's also what I have discovered. I've been trying to do it more because before, I mean, obviously I was never into medicine the way you are, but when I started meditating and doing these things, which are way more... Uh, natural i felt a lot better which has led me down this path with maths also and we've been studying and looking at different people like yourself and it's super interesting that it's going back to when i look at it i also read something like uh, the yogic uh, stuff and uh, the book of changes in china and these things all the eastern philosophy which i feel like is so close to something like quantum physics or like the stuff you explain or you know, all of that stuff. But why the hell did we go away from that back then? It must be because of the... Well, I just explained to you why. Jacob, I want you to understand. That stuff in Chinese medicine and in Indian medicine, that is based on vitalism. Vitalism is a synonym for energy thermodynamics. 
The problem was at the time the Chinese people, the time the Egyptian people, the time of the Indian people was before quantum mechanics was formalized. So they were directionally accurate, but not 100% accurate. And then I told you the story of, of Rockefeller. What did he do? He came in and made sure he buried vitalism because he went for reductionism. He went for the idea of Newton. See, Newton was about looking at the universe and thinking it was like a clock. And as a clock, if you take each piece out, you should be able to understand. It. Here's where we went off the tracks, because I really want you to understand this, and I want your audience to understand it, because physics really tell you the difference between Rockefeller and uh, the vitalist, which, you know, which are the, the guys in meditation, the monks. It's a very important story. In Newton's world, Time was viewed as absolute, okay? Time didn't vary. We now have the guy in Berlin who worked at the train station next to the clock, Einstein, say, you know what? I think I can explain the things Newton didn't explain. The number one thing being the perihelion of Mercury. He came up with something called general and special relativity. What did general and special relativity really say? Time is relative. In fact, we went even greater than that. Everything is relative. So what does that mean? Matt? What's the implications of Newton's world to Einstein's world? This is the most important thing I'm going to tell you in this podcast. It means there's no cause and effect. What is randomized controlled clinical trials based on? Cause and effect. And powering up a study to like a million people or two million people to get an idea what's right. But what did Einstein really find? Turns out there's no cause and effect and everything's based on probability. What was the consequence of that? We got Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, where everything is based on probability. Things are more probable or not going to be true. That's actually the science of nature. Okay? So when you turn around in centralized medicine and say, we're going to use the randomized controlled clinical trial, which bases on cause and effect, immediately you know that this is a paradigm that's not true. It's based on Newton's world 500 years ago. It's not based on the world that we know to be true from 1905 onward. So you have to then start to question yourself, wait a minute, everything we study in medicine is based on Newtonian physics. There's going to be things that are wrong. Things are masquerading as truths today that are not really true. That was my first wake-up call. When I realized that, that's what got me to go, shit. Then I started to look for other decentralized ideas. The big one I shared with you in the, the Ruben Uberman podcast was the issue about blue light and nocturnal animals and how we study nutrition. This is the reason why I don't believe anything that a nutritionist, a dietitian, or a clinical pharmacist says. Why? Because every single drug that we know has been tested in a lab under blue light. How do we know that the effect is not going to be different under sunlight? You don't know. We never tested it. And then there's a, a QA, a qualitative assessment program in photosynthesis. In mitochondria, we only make deuterium depleted water. How many studies do you think in medicine have ever been done utilizing deuterium depleted water? I'm going to tell you the number is less than 50. Everything else is, no, we can use it. We shouldn't. And if you think about the fathers of biochemistry, uh, Linus Pauling and Albert St. Georgie, what did we effectively do to figure out all these boxcars you know, that Peter Adia thinks he's an expert on? We took cells, we homogenized them in a test tube, took all the water out just to leave the boxcars behind and think that we can understand the boxcars without the water. Turns out the water is the transformer of light energy to turn on and off the proteins. So when you realize this, you go, we haven't done anything right. In fact, we've done everything possibly wrong because of the way we study things through centralized processes. And when you realize that you have a duty, or at least I have a duty as an MD to tell you and Mads what my perspective is, why my perspective is, and why I don't believe what I was taught. It's not crazy talk anymore. Now it should be blatantly obvious why there's a problem. And then you as the public, you get to vote. Why? Because at least in the United States, we spend tax dollars on research. We all have to begin to start telling 
politicians to fund and and people like Fauci. Remember, people like Fauci spent money on his friends to study the centralized way. That's how we wound up with COVID. Okay, and because it was wrong, what did we do to the world? It was a big problem. This is the reason why I think my nurse said the time is now to speak out. Time is now to tell this information to guys like Jacob and guys like Mads and your guys' audience because I want you to begin to question everything. You know, it's not that the Chinese guys were wrong. It's not that the Indians were wrong. They had part of the story right because they were looking at energy. Rockefeller destroyed that paradigm. And he did it because he knew that he could control the public and he knew that he could bankrupt America doing it, which is what his original goal was because Congress tried to break up his monopoly. That is the reason why it happened. And now he's even captured the government. Not only, not only did he capture the public's health, but he's captured the executive branch and he's captured Congress. The only place he hasn't captured yet is the Supreme Court. And the reason the deep state in the United States went after Trump so bad is because Trump actually put people on the court that are protecting the foundational documents. All the people in Rockefeller's community, they want to destroy the Constitution. See, everybody thinks America is a great place because of our borders. It's not. It's not the borders. What makes America great is the idea that's in our founding documents. Okay? These are European people who came over and told King George of England, kiss our ass. We're going we're gonna to worship God the way we want, and you're not going to tax us. That's the basis of the United States. And the reason we like our guns is because Minutemen, people with no training, peasants, destroyed the biggest army in the world at that time because we had guns. This is the reason why it's the Second Amendment. And what did Thomas Jefferson tell people in our documents? You don't need guns to hunt. You need guns to make sure the government doesn't treat you badly. Guess what, Mads? Guess what, Jacob? The government right now is trying to block the sun in the United States. The peasants need the guns, okay? Australia took the guns away. Canada is trying to take the guns away. Europe doesn't like guns. You see the, the, the difference between us? And I got this issue right now. We're mad as hell in the United States. Why? Because of COVID. And we know that the government's been a problem. We know that centralized medicine's been a problem. And here's the last bit of the story, Jacob and Mads, I haven't told you, that you're going to be stunned at. We have this famous guy in the United States that nobody in Europe knows about. His name is Benjamin Rush. He has a medical school named after him in Chicago called Rush Medical School. You know why he's famous? He told... Thomas Jefferson, 250 years ago, while the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was being made, that we needed to put a clause in there about medical tyranny. Because he felt that medicine could be used as tyranny against the people at some day. He, Thomas Jefferson thought it was so unlikely for something like that to happen. That's the reason it wasn't placed in the Constitution. It took 250 years for people like Bill Gates people like Trump, people like Biden, people like Obama, people like Clinton, people like Ronald Reagan, people, every president after JFK actually allowed different steps for us to get the code. That's how we got Anthony Fauci. Remember, Anthony Fauci was the number one uh, civil servant, number one salary in the United States, and his science created COVID. He, under his watch, allowed this to happen. He created medical tyranny that Benjamin Rush warned us about. And guess what? There's still no protection in the Constitution for us. But guess what? I'm sitting in a little country right now who's actually learning this lesson. They just changed their Constitution about money. Now they're looking to change the Constitution about this. But what's the message I bring to you? Do not think that the people of the United States didn't know about this problem 250 years ago. But our founding fathers, a big mistake they made is not putting this in. One of the only things that I can get behind Trump about is that he put the Supreme Court in there 
to block some of the key pathways that would harm the public in the future. For example, the goal of the people from the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, IMF, you know, and the Biden administration is to make a central bank digital coin. Why? Because that effectively transfers fiat money to government control. You see it now in China where people on their phone can't get on the subway if they don't follow the rules of the government. That's against the Constitution of the United States. The Fourth Amendment of the Constitution doesn't allow that. If Trump didn't put the two people on the Supreme Court that he did, we would likely have a Supreme Court that would allow a CBDC to come in and we'd be screwed. Because without the freedom of money, everything, you basically you're communist without being communist. And that's effectively what the government in the United States has done for 250 years. They've slowly dis- tried to destroy the power of the people and the documents. And guess what? The last piece was Benjamin Rush's piece, medical tyranny. We have just lived it. We have all experienced it. But you know what, Jacob and Matt? People are not willing to talk about it this way. Why? Because they don't know the history of the United States. Europeans, Europeans should know the history of the United States because we were the little country that said, fuck you to the to, to centralization. This country was based on decentralization, but guess what? We've become a, a country of centralized, lazy, fat slobs. And we need to change that. We need to go back to our roots to be wild animals, to run in nature like the Indians of this country used to do. And we need to tell the government, fuck you. This is our country. We do what we want to do. You're not going to tell us what to do. And the, the rules of delineation are in the document. You cannot step over that line. And if you do, expect us to pull the ammunition out. We will come for you. So I have a question for you, Jack. I don't know. Can you can you see me? No? Okay, I have some camera issues, but if the mic is working, that's the most important here. Yeah, the mic is fine. That's perfect. Let's uh, rewind a bit, uh, because I want to know a bit, about, uh, a bit more about sunlight since we're here in the Scandinavia. Because although sunlight clearly seems to be a top three factor for all living beings, there must be a way to, 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 to live without light as well. Um, here I'm thinking about us in, us, us, us in the Scandinavia who in the winter months only can see the sun for a few hours per day, or even the bear during its time of hibernation. So what are your thoughts about that process, that geographical uh, evolutionary pattern? Well, you, you, there absolutely is an adaptation for uh, Homo sapiens to live at that level. There wasn't an uh, adaptation for Neanderthals to do it. That's the reason why Neanderthals are not found above the 51st latitude, uh, because they had bigger brains. They had 125 grams more brain, uh, and you need more sunlight to run bigger brains. That's effectively why they went extinct. But it's also effectively why we do well. It's why we lost our hair compared to the Neanderthals and the chimps so that you could absorb more. And you know that most Scandinavians, like you two guys, blonde hair, blue eyes. Why? Because that makes you more sensitive to absorb the shitty sun that's there. But what have Scandinavians learned in the last probably, I'd say, 20,000 years when they moved from uh, the East African Rift Zone up to high latitude. You use geothermal volcanism, number one. That's very, very prominent in uh, Iceland, which you can see. But the other thing that Scandinavians have been epic at, use geothermal units, like heating pools outside. You guys use sauna. That's infrared light. And it turns out, out of the sun, the most dominant part of sunlight is infrared light, which is red. And you can get infrared a light when you use sauna the problem is most people that use sauna now like in the united states the sauna is very underpowered the sauna that you guys use and the geothermal pools that you guys have in scandinavia is off the chain so when you understand you're connected in nature when you're in a geothermal pool let me explain to you what's happening the magnetic flux is off the chain why because what makes the heat is the magma chamber below coming to the surface This makes the FO head on the ATPA spin faster. The infrared light, both near and far, also stimulates cytochrome C oxidase to work better. This is the reason why you can run well when you have less brain tissue at high latitude. But you'll notice that there's a limit even to high latitude. This is the reason why, say, for example, in Norway, most people in the country live 
from 64 latitude down. When you go too high latitude, even the boreal forest that circles the entire globe ends right around the 60th latitude. Photosynthesis is very difficult to run. You don't have good light. It's not good. And for anybody who likes it's in Iceland right now, <clears throat> I was just there two weeks ago. It stays light out 24 hours a day. Makes living, makes living there very difficult. Why? Because you have no light stability. The further you're away from the equator, it stays on. So two and a half weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I um uh, at eleven thirty at night I did a uh, Instagram with a guy from Uruguay. It was still sunlight out. Here in El Salvador, it gets dark every day, 6.30. Why? Because there's more light stability. Turns out the more light stability you have, the easier it becomes for you to live your life. In Scandinavia, you have to do things like uh, the survivors of the Titanic. You have to do more sauna. You have to do more geothermal pools. You have to do more ground. Why? Because when you live around volcanoes, uh, it turns out that the ground has more net negative charge. You know that your feet sweat. So that's good. You guys also know you have a lot of snow. So when you go out in snow, you get albedo effect. Even though the sun stinks, you're getting increased amount from the sun. The problem is most Scandinavians today, they wear goggles. If they're smart, they can throw the goggles away. They don't need them. I mean, you guys probably remember the podcast I did with Matt Sketzler eight, nine years ago, where I told the German guy, I said, go up to the top of the Alps and ski in your underwear now with no goggles on it. He did it. He posted a video of it. Because remember, Germans are just like Scandinavian people. Uh, they come from the same stock. They're all uncoupled apple types. Doesn't mean that you can't live well in Scandinavia. But remember, one of the things that have happened in Scandinavia, especially Finland, Finland has the second highest rate of type 1 and type 2 diabetics now. And the reason for that is now, in the last, say, 30 years, we've introduced technology which ruins the non-visual system. It's another stressor to the system when you already live in a tough place, which is Scandinavia. So it's going to make it more difficult for you to adapt. doesn't mean you can't do it. just means that you have to do more things right. And the problem is with people in Scandinavia, as long as you live as close as you can to the rules of nature, I think you can stay away from Neolithic disease. But I will tell you, if you break the rules of nature, especially around light, water, and magnetism, you will pay for it, Neolithic disease. But it's more difficult to us to to live close to nature uh, because of the weather. Because not only is it more difficult to be grounded because of the cold seasons, like uh, six, seven, eight months a year, but also because of the uh, lack of sunlight. This is the reason why you need to embrace, uh, you know, touching the earth, geothermal pool. Make make a pool. Look, the beautiful thing about all Scandinavia is there's a huge temperature differential if you just go one or two meters in the in the dirt. You put a pipe there, you can make your own geothermal pool. Why? Because the ground is such there, but that's how it was built. Everything in Scandinavia has volcanic history, okay? The, the most active part right now is Iceland. But uh, I will tell you, uh, trying to think, Finland, Sweden, Norway especially, you see all the fjords cut out by the ice that was there. All of that land was once laid down from the volcanoes that are underneath the hot spot in ice. That's where it all came from. And you, if you put that in your environment and you are mindful of the light cycle and use it, you can make it work. But do I agree with you that sometimes the best treatment for you, especially when you embrace technology, that you may need to go down to uh, Canary Islands two or three weeks you know, maybe every six or seven weeks in the wintertime. If I was in your shoes, that's what I would do. I would make sure that I have an escape hatch to the light because I think that's important. That's even more important when you have a mitochondrial disease. If you don't have a mitochondrial disease, then you're fine. Like, for example, if you're a Scandinavian and you think lifting everything is smart in a gym that's blue lit, you're an idiot. I want you to lift everything's outside while you're doing cold thermogenesis. That's that's really what I want you to do, because if you do that, you can win. And there's no reason when you work out outside to protect your feet from frostbite that you can't wear leather soles. Okay, Leather is animal skin. That still allows you to ground. And remember, because your ground is effectively volcanic, 
it carries more of a net negative charge. You have sweat glands on your feet that allows you to get those electrons free. What do those electrons mean when you get them free in your body? It goes back to Einstein's other miracle paper we haven't talked about, photoelectric effect. It's the best way for you to absorb light. Even when the light is poor, if you don't have electrons in your body, you can't absorb the light. So it's imperative that you guys get the story. Where do you get the story absolutely correct in Scandinavia? All the, all the water around you is cold, filled with fish with huge amounts of DHA. You guys do a phenomenal job of eating the seafood that Uncle Jack tells everybody else to eat. It's part of all of your culture. I mean, you guys eat shit that nobody would eat, okay? you The Faroe Islands guy eat violent wave fermented whale blubber that tastes like shit, okay? You guys, you know that. You, you eat all different types of herring, mackerel, sardines. You don't realize the reason why this has helped your culture, the Viking culture, is because though that food is loaded with electrons. This allows you to live in a light poor environment, okay? And it turns out the most important part of light for our biology is the infrared A light. You do need infrared, I should say UVA and UVB for different things. But if you do those things to the nth degree, which is what your culture has done for 2,000 years, you can make it at high latitude, okay? I'm not going to tell you that you're going to thrive, but you're going to be able to do very, very well if you do that, okay? Yeah. That's a good message, yeah. But that's also, what about the cold? We we talked to Wim Hof, and obviously there's some huge benefits from that. Um, and that's also something we well, could... I told, you the benefits, I told you what the benefits were in the Uberman podcast. And if you guys don't know what the huge benefit is, I'll tell you very simply. This goes directly to Mad's last question, so it's a perfect segue. The more cold you are in, the more endogenous light you make stronger than the sun from your semiconductors inside your body. So how does a Scandinavian make light stronger than the sun? By embracing the cold. Why? All wideband semiconductors create VUV light. What is VUV light? 200 to 400 nanometers. That's light that's stronger than what comes in the sun. That's the reason why the program is built into you. That is the reason why you can make it in Scandinavia when you're connected to nature. This is the main reason cold helps people. This is the reason why in my cold thermogenesis series, I told everybody the mammalian dive reflex is a remnant of us embracing the cold. And it turns out that mammals have this unbelievable ability to create their own light inside. And that ability comes from one single gene, the POMC gene. And the way it works has a lot to do with two parts of that cleave gene, which is alpha MSH, which makes melanin. And then the other part of the story, which is ACTH that makes cortisol. And when you understand, as long as you're connected, even in a high latitude environment, that you can win, you will win. But when you start, like I was just up in your guy's neck of the woods two and a half weeks ago, and I was amazed. It was middle of July, and people were walking around with down coats on, and it was 70 degrees. I'm like, are you guys crazy? Take your freaking clothes off and walk around. I mean, I'm not kidding you. One day up there was 55 degrees, and I was in the swimming pool. And people were looking at me like I was crazy. Yeah, people are too, I mean, I mean, it's they're too sensitive, but it's this decentralization is in every part. It's not just in the medicine, because if you think about it, I also, it's only recently when uh, that I've discovered like the the grounding and the, like the last couple of years, the grounding and the, the sun's effect and clothes. Think about it. Every, every industry is decentralized in a way that it makes you weaker. No, centralized. It's centralized. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Centralized, centralized, yeah. Oh, you're absolutely correct. And see, when, Jacob, when you say something like this, this to me on a podcast, it makes me happy because then it tells me you're truly waking up. You're beginning to realize where there's a problem. Like, for example, the sweater that you have on now, so you guys understand, even when you go outside and say it's a sunny day and you have the sweater on, if the sweater is made out of cotton, infrared A light still gets through the cotton and gets to your skin. You still get a benefit. 
Okay, but is the benefit better if you take the sweater off? The answer is yes. But you still get a benefit. See, when you put when you put the uh, down jacket on, over, it's no good. Yeah, but guess what? I don't want you to take your shirt off inside unless the window's open. Because you got blue light around. Blue light will kill you. Yeah, but it's open, though. That's good. And that is good because that's what you want to do. And you do get a benefit of that. The thing that I need for guys like you to do since you're high latitude livers, I want you to take the information that we talked about here and and really expand on it for your audience. Let them know Jack's not saying everybody needs to move to the 13th latitude. Jack's saying if you're really, really sick and your mitochondria is fundamentally broken, you're going to have to come to this latitude in order to get better. doesn't mean that you can't go back to Scandinavia and be okay. But if you know, you're a type 1 diabetic or type 2 diabetic and you have carotid disease and you're getting ready to you know, develop neurodegeneration, this is a huge problem. And this is not a problem that you're going to be able to do in Scandinavia. Why? Because you need much more power externally into your system to power your batteries. It's like you have to have a big jump to change everything. And this is why you have to do extraordinary things when you live at high latitude. But most of your guys' culture does those extraordinary things. For 2,000 years, you've done that. The problem is, the last 50 years, you try to be like Americans, and you don't want to be like us. That's like when Mads called me and said, download the app, put these things in your ear. I'm like, Mads, are you out of your fucking mind? I'm not doing any of that. That's the last thing I'm going to do. Because guess what? That feeds into the problem. I want I want you guys to do what I'm doing. Embrace nature all the time. If you do that, I promise you, you can kick ass and take names. You can be just like the Sherpas. And I'm going to tell you another story so you guys know this. When I was up at the high latitude for two and a half weeks, I was pretty tent. You can look at my Instagram because I was in Destin, Florida, which is 28th latitude in the summer. So I, I was really, really dark. When I went up to high latitude, my nurse lost her tent. I didn't lose my tent. You know why? I stayed connected the whole time I was up there. I was in cold. All the people up there, like this guy, I went, I'm going to tell you the story. I went to the volcanoes in Iceland wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I don't, it was like three degrees C, three degrees C. And all the people were dressed like in the Arctic Circle. And the old ladies would come up to me and go, aren't you cold? On my feet, I wore blue suede shoes with leather soles. Walked everywhere. You know why I didn't lose my tan? That's the reason why. This is the reason why the Sherpas are tan. This is the reason why the people that used to live in Alaska, they also stayed, they kept their tan. It's also the reason why people in Scandinavia don't have a tan. Yeah, and it's interesting because we have a phenomenon here called winter depression, which is fucking... We call it, we call it SAD. That's what we call it, seasonal affective disorder. <clears throat> and the best way for you to fix it is sunlight. But if you don't have sunlight, I'm going to tell you, geothermal pools. That's sauna. Do as much as you can. But any commercial sauna would do, or does it have to be... No, commercial sauna sucks. I'm talking about sauna like you built. Go make in your backyard a geothermal... Talk to an engineer. In your neck of the woods, this is the easiest thing to build. You just put pipes underneath the ground, and you're using the difference between the air temperature and in the ground to make this little difference, and then you can make a sauna. This sauna will be amazing. You can sit in it. You can sit in the pool. It's almost like you're making your own blue lagoon in your backyard. And then what you should do is then have the cold plunge on the side. And what do you do? You go from cold plunge to the geothermal pool constantly. Guess what? Then you can win. Because when you're in the cold water, your body will make light that's stronger than the sun. This will turn on the melanin inside your body. People don't even realize dopamine is made from UV light, but they also don't realize that cold increases dopamine by 250%. You know why? Because your mitochondria inside you makes light that makes dopamine. This was the magic in the Uberman podcast that people didn't get. That we make light, the cells make light. Correct. Those are the ultra-weak biophotons. 
This is the core of the mechanics. This is the work of Fritz Pop. <clears throat> this is the works of, uh, of Roland Van Wick. This is decentralized medicine, my friend. This is the difference between Rockefeller medicine. What I'm bringing to you right now is realize that you're an amazing mammal. You have this ability built inside of you, and you don't even know it. You don't even know why the Vikings could do what they did. But guess what? I'm the guy whose people come from the 59th latitude. I got freckles. You see it. I'm no different than any Scandinavian. I'm an uncoupled apple type. What am I doing? The same thing that you guys do. The difference is I'm running on a different program. now. I'm using more of the sun. Do I still use the cold? Yeah. I go in the pool all the time. Yesterday, here, take a look. Let me show this to you. That right there, Black Sand Beach, Pacific Ocean. All right there, you can see the whole thing. That's that's what that's what we go in. That's what we do CT. Now, the water is warm, but it's still below my body temperature. So that means you're still doing CT. And that's all you need to do. That stimulates it. Remember, though, the light here. Light here is phenomenal. I mean, literally, put your mads in the light here, you'd be able to handle maybe 15 minutes. But that's because you don't have your solar callus built up. You don't have enough MSH on your surface. But can you build all that up very quickly? Very quick. And Scandinavians can do it better than anybody. Why? Because they eat a lot of seafood. Turns out seafood upregulates the program in you. All you're missing is a little bit of sun. And then you build up to it slowly. Then you can do what I do. If I can stay in the sun for eight, nine hours a day, there's no reason Jacob and Matt's can't do it. Why? Because my people are the same people that come from your people. Sure. For sure. But why is UV light so demonized now through the centralized world? I told you the reason why. Because if you get in the sun, you don't need Rockefeller's medicine. Come on, Mads. You gotta start putting things together, bro. The system, the system, the system is built to create customers, Mads. So anything, anything that you do to take customers away, they're going to demonize. See, this is the problem with the European mindset. You don't understand how capitalism really works. Okay? When you understand that they create customers, this is the reason why they demonize the sun. And, and I want you to think about this, because I said this to one of my members that's here now. If the dermatologists and the ophthalmologists are right that the sun is toxic, everybody who gets melanoma, should have a vitamin D level that's through the roof, right? Because the sun is bad. And right, you know that the sun makes vitamin D. Guess what the story is? Everybody who gets melanoma has low vitamin D. It's exactly the opposite. It's 180 degrees opposite what they tell you. But guess what? They got Jacob and Mads and Wim Hof believing that the sun is toxic. It is absolutely preposterous. And when you see it, when you see it for yourself, you start to go, Oh, shit. I've been lied to so long. This is total bullshit. It turns out the light that gives you the melanoma is the light that's inside, the light that Rockefeller's friend, J.P. Morgan, made. That's now called General Electric. Okay? When did that happen? He got involved in the power wars between Tesla and Westinghouse and, and Thomas Edison. Dude, that's how this all started. Light, electricity, created the perfect opportunity for Rockefeller to take over public health. That's exactly how it happened. You need to understand how it happened. Because guess what? In Europe at that time, nobody had light. You guys were still using kerosene and candles like we did. But as soon as we turned on light at the World's Fair in 1893, then they did it in Paris in 1924, everybody wanted light at night. And guess what? That's when everybody started to get sick, especially in Scandinavia. Yeah, it's in what about those uh, machines? For instance, like, uh, what is it called? Like a tanning machine or um, like... Uh... Well, they're good, but you know what the problem is in the EU? The EU uh, old doesn't allow you to have UV, UVB light in your tanning machines over there because they took it out. So what you need to do, <clears throat> that's the reason why you guys need to travel for better sun. But does is there a benefit... To UVA beds, yeah, the benefit there is for blood pressure um, to make nitric oxide. But I would tell you, you need, in my opinion, when you use UVA, you should always use it with infrared A. So you need to use both. <clears throat> but am I a fan of that? 
for you guys in Scandinavia, I am. I would strongly recommend it. But you need to learn how to use it because if you don't use it the right way, because remember, what you're effectively doing when you use a tanning bed, remember the Pink Floyd uh, album cover. We have seven frequencies of light, right? When you use a UVA light, you're only using one of the seven. You need to have the other controller that protects you. That protection is infrared A light. So remember, from the time the sun's up, time the sun sets, red light is always present. UVA light, UVB light, especially where you guys are, it changes diurnally and seasonally. So you need to realize that purple light is never present on Earth without infrared A. If you remember that rule, you're Scandinavian, you say, okay, that means that I need to have either geothermal pool sauna or infrared A light and use that anytime that I use UVA light, then you're good. You can also, I have zero problems with people using SAD lights, you know, the bright lights in the morning. Uh, but do I, am I concerned about those lights now because they're additive to the technology problem that you guys have? Because remember, one thing about Scandinavia, uh, out of all the countries in Europe, you guys tend to use more technology than just about anybody else, especially like Estonia, Latvia, Finland. This is the reason why Finnish people are getting sick. Finnish people are probably the sickest people in Scandinavia. So you you talk a lot about uh, grounding sun exposure, particularly sun exposure being close to equator, uh, water consumption also being close to equator, or am I missing something according to the deuterium depleted water? No, you're missing something. The, the water, that's one of the other benefits that you guys have as Scandinavians. The water at high latitude is much better where you are than it is where I am. The reason for that, It's the hydrology cycle on Earth. Um, normal seawater has 155 parts per million of deuterium. Remember the way the hydrology cycle works? We evaporate water, it makes the clouds. The clouds then fall rain on us. The rain where you are turns first to snow, then to ice, then it melts when the seasons change. The first water that comes out is deuterium depleted. Why? Because the way ice melts, the deuterium stays in the ice. So the worst thing to ever do is chip off ice in Scandinavia and put it in your, in your water. You want to drink the first mountain water from a string that comes out. That's the best water in the world because it's around 140 to 145 parts per million. So the classic Icelandic water, the classic Voss, you know, uh, the water that you guys have up there is spectacular. Why does that, why should that make sense to Jacob and Matt? Because your light is so poor, nature made it so the water is a better electromagnetic capacitor for light, meaning it absorbs more light than when it doesn't have deuterium. Down here in, at 13 north latitude in El Salvador, it doesn't matter. The fucking light is so strong that you can put as much deuterium in the water you want. You're going to get so much power here, it doesn't matter. Okay? So the water here is not good. Now, the grounding effect here is spectacular for one reason. This is a land bridge between North and South America. You guys also have this benefit. Anything that's made from a volcano has a tremendous amount of net negative charge. So, for example, you guys don't get as many uh, lightning and thunderstorms. Why? Because at high latitudes, the, the, the thunder and lightning storms you guys get is the aurora, the aurora borealis. It stays up in the atmosphere. Down here in the equator, all the aurora energy is discharged. In electricity that hits not only the lava tubes, but also the Pacific Ocean. What does that do? It re-energizes the land to make more net negative charge so that when humans walk across it, they absorb even more. This is the reason why people in low latitudes have darker skin, because they have more net negative uh, electrons from the Earth. The sun hits them, they get more melanin. That's how you get darker skin. The reverse is why you guys have white skin and blue eyes. Okay. The way you offset it is from your seafood and your good water. This is the, the decentralization in nature, how it works. In other words, what you're bad in, then nature makes it something good for you. The thing is here at the 13th latitude, you have much more margin of safety where you are. You guys are at a latitude such you don't have any margin of safety. So when you start to do something wrong, you start to pay a price for it. That's the key. And that's why I tell you, when you start to get sick at the high latitude, your best way to get better is to embrace, come on south and do some of this thing uh, and get better because you, you can have a massive effect on your health, you know, right away. 
And probably the number one thing that's happening in Europe, since uh, Tesla's power grid has been in, put in the world, your guy's power grid oscillates at 50 hertz, United States and South America, and also Central America, 60 hertz. We now know that the intermitochondrial membrane oscillates at 100 hertz. So 50 hertz is the second harmonic. So this is the reason why there's much more autoimmunity and EHS in Europe than there is in the United States. In the United States, we get more obesity. Uh, and type 2 diabetes. So that's the reason why the disease process from the mitochondria is different. That's why I always tell people, your zip code trumps your genetic code because the way energy is transformed into mitochondria determines the diseases you get. So this is the reason why we look so different, you know, in our disease profiles. Um, but the mechanism and the way in which we work, like the wiring diagram in the mitochondria is exactly the same. The, the major difference in the wiring diagram between low latitudes and high latitudes is the haplotype. And usually the SNP profile or SAP profile, what does that stand for? SNP is single nucleotide polymorphism. SAP is single amino acid polymorphism. And that allows us to change how we use sunlight or how we use cold programming based on uh, our, our environment, you know, in terms of the lineage from our mitochondrial DNA that comes from our mother's side. Um, most people who are Scandinavian have uncoupled haplotypes. What does that mean? We have to eat more uh, so that we can create more heat, so that we can generate internal heat to offset the cold. That's what happens. In southern latitudes, we have L0, L1, L2 haplotypes. We don't do that. So they eat less because they don't have to generate heat to live in cold environments because it's always warm inside the tropics, you know, no matter what season it is. The only difference in seasons here is wet and dark. That's it. I should say wet and dry. That's the only two seasons you really have at the equator. And usually at the equator, you have 12 hours of sunlight uh, and 12 hours of darkness year round. It doesn't change. Even inside the tropics, the main difference at, say, December or June 21st is 45 minutes of light change. For example, we're right after the end of July. Here we're regaining 45 minutes of light. In December here, you only lose 45 minutes of light. So you have a lot of hours and 15 minutes of sunlight. And this is the reason why people don't get SAD or seasonal affective disorder at this latitude and why you guys do. Because right now where you guys are, it stays light out till 10, 11 o'clock, but nobody's out at that time. You're not getting that sun. Most people are asleep. And then in the wintertime, when it gets dark at 3 o'clock, you know, the sun raises at 9, you only get six hours or five and a half hours of sunlight your body needs more of that. That's why, that's why I told you, technology has brought us from outside in. And you don't realize that. But that's exactly what the effect is. And that's why I try to tell you, your frontal lobes have changed the rules. It has allowed you to break laws of nature. See, Viking times, Viking times, they were out hunting for seals and, and looking for new lands and looking for someone to conquer. And... Uh, they were out in the ships and using Icelandic spar to tell where the sun was. These are the things that your people did. And over the last 1,000, 2,000 years, you've become more centralized. You've lived more like the kings of England have told you to live. That was a problem. And it got worse when the kings of Silicon Valley gave you Apple computers and Microsoft and, and earphones that Mads wants me to put in my ears. <laughs> not gonna happen and I don't care I'm gonna tell you Matt I'm gonna tell you this in the future it doesn't matter if the sound quality is not good if the information is good and it changes your life people are going to love your content never forget that always go for the quantity over the quality my friend that is a decentralized fact yeah. another thing I'm just a, re a big problem with that that the US or whatever everything is the same is that nothing is really fitted to the environment that we live. Like you're saying, like everything is the same. You have the same working hours everywhere. Okay, you realize that's by design. You understand what I'm saying? That is, that idea came straight from Rockefeller. But it's so deep that it's almost in, like it's almost impossible to even think how to change that because everything from middle school up to, the food industry is fucking... Listen, it's ingrained. It's ingrained. And that's what that 
when you say this to me and I see your eyes getting bigger, it makes me happy. Because guess what I'm trying to tell you? Guess what I'm trying to tell you? That's the reason why you don't realize why I don't go after Wim. I, I, Wim is bringing people to the cold. As long as he brings people back to nature, guess what? Uncle Jack is happy. What I want you to realize, Jacob and Mads, when you do your work, I want you to open the window. I want you to say to your boss, you know what? I'm going to take this meeting, but I'm going to do this meeting on Skype, and I'm going to do it outside while I'm having a cafe, and I'm going to have maybe no shirt on, and maybe people will look at me crazy, but I'm going to do that. You know, you may put a cap on. You know, you may do this, but you know what? You're going to do what's right for your biology because you know what? You do better. Remember, this other famous guy from England, Charles Darwin, came up with the idea of survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest also is a centralized idea. It's not true. You know what the, the key the key is? This conditions of existence. In his first edition of his book, he said, of the two, conditions of existence are more important. What is conditions of existence? It's about the environment. He knew the environment was really important. But the guys that took his message after it, Huxley, Dawkins, they totally agree. So you know what the most important thing is, Jacob and Mads? It's what you just said, Jacob, and why I interrupted you. It's now about survival of the wisest in the information technology. Why? Because you can be really fit and still die. If you're fit and you're doing it in a blue light gym, it's the stupidest thing you can do for your colony of mitochondria. So what I want you to realize is I want you to lift heavy things like a Viking, but I want you to do it outside in the snow. Got it? I want you to really be a Viking. That's who you are. And don't make don't don't be afraid of who you are, because inside of you, you have H and K haplotype. That is who you are. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. Dude, decentralized science always makes sense. The problem is when you get woken up, you start to go, oh, I'll know I'll be successful with you guys when you take the earphones out and throw them away. And you say, we're not going to do this anymore. From now on, we're doing the podcast outside. I don't care if it's snowing or not. We're going outside and we're going to do it. The next time I come back, we should do one in the wintertime when you guys are freezing your ass off. And we're <laughs> All right. I'm down to do that for sure. I'm down to do that. What What is... What was the what was the whole um, change for you? Like I remember, I heard you say that you had uh, forty years of of uh, the centralized, and then eighteen months you just completely. And when I hear you, it, you don't sound like a, a neurosurgeon. You sound like you know fucking everything about history, about physics, about atoms. I mean, what changed your whole? It's because of the way I grew up. Remember, I grew up in a city that truly was built around decentralization, which was New York. But it had a lot of centralized things in it to control people. But when I was a young kid, I was able to go for almost no money to all the museums and learn all the things that I learned. And the rich people who had the special tours, I would just follow the rich people around. And I would learn all these cool things. And I was always fascinated. The one thing you learn about me, I was the, I'm the most curious person you'll ever meet. No one I've ever met is more curious than me. When I can't figure something out, I'm going to figure it out. But one of the things that happened to me as a doctor, I first was a dentist. I became an oral surgeon. Then I was a nurse. So I did residency for almost, uh, I think, 13 years. So for 13 years, I stayed up almost every night fixing humans. This destroyed my biology. So after I think it was three or four years of residency, I got to be re really, really big, really have ruined my biology. It's much, much easier for somebody who has uncoupled haplotype to get fat. Okay, because of the things I told you. So I got up to be 360 pounds, which is like, I don't know, 140 kilos. Okay, really fat. And one day I was giving a talk in Birmingham, Alabama. I had designed some instruments for minimally invasive spine surgery. And when I got up to give the talk, I hurt my knee. And I couldn't even get to the podium without help from the doctors that were there. So I gave my talk. And then after that, I was like, fuck, this really bothered me. This is what started me on the whole path. One of the uh, orthopedic surgeons' wives who were there, her husband examined my knee and said, look, I think you tore your knee meniscus. She goes, I think I know why it happened. Turned out she used to work for one of the big pharma companies that were tied to this whole Rockefeller paradigm. And she goes, I think I know why this happened. She goes, I want to give you this book and these papers. 
And what was the book in the papers really all about? Lep? Who discovered Lep? Rockefeller University, 1994, New York City. After I went to medical school, I was already done. I never learned about Lep. I didn't know anything about it. And what was she trying to tell me? The big pharma company that found leptin, they did synthetic leptin trial, found out it worked great. Guess what they did? They buried the trial. As soon as they buried the trial, they didn't want anybody to know a lot about leptin. Then they went out and patented in all the cold receptors. Oh, now you want to know why cold works. Because the leptin melanocortin pathway works via cold thermogenesis. All the things that I just told you guys about. But why doesn't the paradigm of Rockefeller want this information to get out? Because then you'll find out the things that Jack and Wim are telling you are true. Now, you don't need a prescription pad. So what did I do? Then I started to do the leptin melanocortin pathway on me, and I shrink. And all of a sudden, I get you can You can read about it. It's on my site. It's called the leptin prescription. And then the other one's called the cold thermogenesis protocol. Like, you guys in Scandinavia think that WIMP came up with this early. I was way before WIMP. In fact, in the United States, all the cold was was done on uh, cool sculpting. That was patented in 2008. I wrote my cold thermogenesis protocol in 2000, 2002. This is over 20 years ago I've been doing this. For sure, for sure. So... I'm interested in knowing what 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 you what, what you consider to be uh, the, the decentralized fundamental pillars of health. If our audience should have a takeaway from this, this podcast, what are the most fundamental things they can do to optimize their health in an optimal way? Okay, if you're Scan- if you're Scandinavian, this is there's going to be a little change. The answer I always give to this question on every podcast is never not see a sunrise ever again. You must see the sunrise. The caveat for Scandinavians, if you can see the sunrise, make sure that you get in cold during when the sunrise should be there. Why? Because when you're in the cold, you will make light stronger than the sun inside of you. You guys have the ability to do that all the time. So that's like what I would say. 1A is for everybody. Always see the sunrise. 1B for Scandinavians, if you live let's say 51st latitude or above where all the Neanderthals died and where homo sapiens survived, embrace the cold, embrace it. Like you can't imagine. And, and you take your jacket off. Do not wear the big uh, uh, thing that Jacob had on. I want you to be in a t-shirt shorts. Like uncle Jack was in up in, in your neck of the woods. You got, you guys would be stunned how I, I told my nurse this. I said, These are my people. I live the way my people should. All the people I saw, they thought I was crazy. And I told them, I said, the truth is told, you're crazy. I'm the one that's doing it right. That's what I want Jacob and Matt to tell the people in Scandinavia. Embrace the cold, even if you cannot get the sun, because the program inside of you as a Viking is to make the light that you don't get from the sun. That's the story. And that could be made within. Yeah. That's a good takeaway. And also ground. Walk with no f- shoes. Fuck shoes. Right. Well, you know, you know, I always tell Jacob people make like the Sphinx. Unfortunately, the Sphinx story doesn't go good in Scandinavia. But the Sphinx looks to the east, right? To the sun. All four extremities on the ground. Why? Because we have ecrine sweat glands on our hands and our feet. We're the only primate that has that. You know why? Because you're designed to get free electrons from the earth. So if you can do that, when you have the snow on the ground, Jacob and Mads, Uncle Jack is 100% about that. I just don't want you to get frostbite. I hope these things for your audience begin to resonate. I hope people, you know, go back and read some of the original stuff that I wrote. I want people to know this has been going on for 20 years. This isn't new because I just talked to Rick and you. I want you to know that the story of human biology is really 3.8 billion years old. And I will take you all the way back and explain to you why we work the way we do. The physics of organisms is what decentralization is about. And proof of work should be seen in every single reflection of any advice you get. If there is no evidence of proof of work, it's proof of stake, you reject it. That is centralized bullshit. You're going to get taken advantage of. 
if you follow that one little rule, you will be superhuman. You will be like the American Indian. You will be like the Viking. You will be like the Sherpa. You will be the wild, silly talking monkey you are designed to be. Mm -hmm. Can you can you give an example of that? Because sometimes I know that proof of work and proof of stake and Bitcoin and stuff. Uh, but in faces in science, what, what would I look for? Well, look, look right behind me. You see this right here? This is this is chlorophyll. What's the proof of work? The tree has to stay out in the sun to take CO2 and water, suck the CO2 and water in, use sunlight to change it. There's work being done to make the mango. There's work being done to make the coconut. Okay? In your case, when you go outside, Jacob, and you're in the cold, how do you make the light, UV light to infrared light? Proof of work is you had to take your physiology outside, connect to the earth, embrace the cold so your mitochondria can uncouple, make huge amounts of heat to offset it, while inside the melanin sheets in you are absorbing all the VUV light you make. It takes proof of work to make that. You can't do that if you stay inside in front of your computer watching Jerry Springer or whatever the <laughs> hell you guys watch in Scandinavia. Okay? That's proof of state bullshit. It's not that hard to get to understand. It's not. I promise you. It's all around you. The problem is, every time you make a mistake, Windex on your glass eyes, say, I need to look at this like a wild human. This is what I tell people. Uh, I don't have to teach lions and hippos quantum mechanics. Why? Because they live by nature. They totally live by nature. So, they do what they're supposed to do. I want you as the human animal to do what you're supposed to do. You live by your latitude and longitude. That program is built into you. You can do it. But you have to do it properly. And yes, I know you have to go to work. I get it. But that means you need to take a break. Like some people take a smoke break. You take a cold break. You take a sun break. No, no wild animals come out wearing clothes. No wild animals come out with sunglasses from Coco Chanel. Nobody comes out with screen, right? So those are all centralized ideas to keep you in the zoo, to keep you under the finger, to keep you under their power. Embrace yourself. See what the wild mammal does in the winter? It gets a thicker coat, makes more hair. That's how it can do what it does. You'll do the same thing when you live the same way. You'll be stunned. You won't, you'll lose your tan that you make in the in the summer even as a scandinavian i proved it when i was up there people kept looking at me like how are you keeping your tan it's because i'm embracing the cold mm. get the electrons and all that it's yeah. an interesting message well matt this is, i'm gonna start working out outside that's what you should do i mean and that's not really you you guys will be in to see there's levels like whim is giving you one level i'm giving you 19 other levels and i'm explaining yeah. to you how it works and I want you to understand when you do this, all I ask for you to do for me, the debt, your proof of work for me, is tell some of your friends. That's all I want you to do. Tell some of your friends so that enough people begin to start to think better, critically think. So when the government tells you to do something that you know is bullshit, all of us together can see the people in Scandinavia and the people in America, people in El Salvador say, we're not doing that. We're not, we're, that's not where we're going to go. We're going to do this decentralized. That's what we're going to do. And it also makes sense that it's actually good timing by your nurse, because if you think about it, the only thing pretty much that's actually decentralized in our society now is the internet, is the sharing of information, even though it also has bad things with social media, but that's actually one of the only things that's de decentralized where we're kind of free, which is also why it's we're not, it's not. It's not totally decentralized. You, you saw in the United States that it can be centralized and be used. But the number, I always tell people the two things that are decentralized, the artificial one is Bitcoin. The natural one is nature. Those are the two decentralized networks. Those two will never lie. To you. And the reason why, was both based on proof of work and both of, them, both of them have a scarcity. That's the key. You know, people don't realize the scarcity in biology not everything survives. That's why we have extinction events. This is the reason why, you know, people die. When you do the wrong things, nature has a toll for you. You know, when you do the wrong thing in Bitcoin and you buy Ethereum or you buy a shitcoin, 
you're going to go broke. But the same thing is true. The same thing, that, the same thing is true when you put your money, say, in Credit Suisse in, in Europe. You go broke too because the fiat explodes. Or if you're in Argentina or Venezuela. Look, the key is held in wealth or link through decentralization. The story of this podcast for the Europeans is embrace it. Just embrace it. If you don't know much about it, ask more questions. Dive down the rabbit hole. Do not be afraid. If there was something you heard in this podcast, it's your duty as a smart human to be wise. Be wiser than you were yesterday and do something and learn about it. All right. Let's, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's wrap this up. It was great talking with you. It's been a pleasure, Jack. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, and Jack, we'll have an appointment again in three, four, five months when the weather is... Uh, We're going to do all the stuff you said. For sure. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Always learning. Thank you. All right. Take care, guys. Enjoy. Take care.